in the last segment, we were talking about the controversial nature of Muhammad Ali and how in many ways he flew in the face of expectations for white America. Um, at this point, what you've got is rhetorical objections from white America. He is a Muslim and a Christian nation, uh, and that's not sitting well with a lot of people, considering he is the pinnacle of uh, the sporting world, the heavyweight champion of the world. He's also embracing these radical ideas that are coming from people like the Black Panthers and uh, Malcolm X, and this isn't sitting well with a lot of people. The problem is, it's also perfectly within the bounds of the law. There's, there's nothing that he's doing wrong, so the establishment doesn't necessarily have a way to come after him. That changes in 1966. By 1966, America was two years deep into the war in Vietnam. Now, as I'm sure many, most of you are aware, what Vietnam is seeing in American history as is an extension of the Cold War. It's a heating up of the Cold War, so to speak. Now, at the same time, it's coinciding with this, this um, independence movement that's erupting all across the developing world. In the aftermath of World War II, what happened was those old colonial powers, Britain, France, they could no longer afford to run their empires. So in many instances, former colonies, including colonies in Southeastern Asia, were granted their independence. Well, the problem is the, the, the faction, the nationalist faction that is demanding independence in Vietnam happens to be communist, and obviously this is a problem in Cold War America. Now, over the course of time, you see the troop escalation increase year after year after year, and it gets so intense that by 1966, a draft, a military draft, was implemented. Um, part of the reason for this was because the Johnson administration had called for 12-month enlistments, which was seen as a democratic form of conscription, but at the same time, it also meant that you're going to need a lot of people that were going to be drafted and ultimately sent over to Vietnam. Muhammad Ali was one of those individuals. Um, he was training in Miami uh, for a title defense when he, when, when, when he uh, was, was ultimately arrested. And um, in 1966, he was called before the draft board. Uh, they called his name three times. And uh, because he refused induction to the armed services, he was convicted of uh, uh, refusing induction, a federal crime. Now, this was the excuse that the Boxing Commission, that various other institutions in American life, all of his uh, political opponents were, had been waiting for as far as Muhammad Ali and an ability to strip him of the title. What was arguably even more controversial was the comments that Ali had, had made in the aftermath of uh, his posting bail. He posted $5,000 bail, and he was sentenced to, uh, to, to five years, so he's looking at five years in federal, federal penitentiary, and he got a call from the press at this hotel in Miami. Again, the film will do a good job of illuminating this if you choose to watch it. But anyway, um, when the reporter asked him what he thought of the Viet Cong, the resistance movement in Vietnam, um, he said, I don't have any quarrel with the Viet Cong. And uh, if you watch a few, few seconds later, he says, ain't no Viet Cong ever call me the N-word. Now, this is the heavyweight champion of the world weighing in on the uh, war in Vietnam. It was criticizing the American involvement in the war of Vietnam. And although he's not saying it, what Ali is illuminating is it's quite hypocritical for America to preach freedom and democracy to the rest of the world when there's clearly not freedom and democracy right here at home. Um, he's clearly being oppressed based on his political, based on his uh, religious views. Ali elaborated on this in the coming days, and for the most part, I'm paraphrasing of course, but for the most part what he said was, I'm not going 10,000 miles away from home to kill other poor people. So an athlete, and I'm not knocking Ali intellectually, but all of these gifted intellectuals and these political pundits and thinkers and whomever you're talking about could 
really describe what America was doing in Vietnam. And here's this athlete, an athlete at the time that was barely literate, that can see this deep and profound um, contradiction with respect to American foreign policy. Now, the immediate consequence of Ali's refusal into the armed forces was that he was stripped of the belt. He, he was stripped of his boxing license altogether, as a matter of fact. And it's not going to be until 1970, almost three years after uh, he had been um, stripped of his title and his license, that he's going to resume his professional boxing career. Atlanta, Georgia was the only city in the country to license Ali to fight, and he fought a guy named Jerry Corey in, the, um, in, in Atlanta. Knocked him out no problem. It really wasn't about that. What it was was demonstrating that Ali still had it, and that he would, um, he would defend, well, not defend, but he would challenge for the, um, for the heavyweight championship of the world uh, the reigning champion, the guy that had become champion in his absence, Smoke and Joe Frazier. Now, this was presented and promoted as the fight to find the real champion, considering Ali claimed the championship, even as he had been forced into exile, and, you know, of course, Joe Frazier uh, claimed it as well. The fight between Ali and Frazier, the first one, proved to be a quite a contrast in terms of styles, uh, but also staying power. After 15 rounds, Frazier emerged victorious, and this represented the first professional defeat of Muhammad Ali. He took it with good grace and uh, dignity. Now, over the course of time, in the early 1970s, the Supreme Court reversed Ali's conviction, and the Justice Department dropped all criminal charges against him. And so naturally, uh, there's this anticipated rematch between Frazier and Ali. The only problem is there was a huge letdown in between, considering Frazier had just lost the belt to George Foreman. Now, Ali would eventually position himself to get another title shot, but before he could have the rematch with Joe Frazier, he'd have to fight uh, George Foreman. Now, this fight is coinciding with the rise of another sports career. Not an athletic career, but a promoter career, a professional career, a guy by the name of Don King. In the early 1970s, King had been doing a, um, um, a prison term, and it was in prison that he listened to the Ali Frazier one fight, and that began his interest in professional boxing. Boxing needed a black promoter, and King pushed his way through and what he did, in addition to really hyping up a lot of these fights, was, was usher in a lot of black talent. Now, a little bit about George Foreman. Foreman was a gold medalist, and in the 1968 Olympic Games, keep in mind, the 68 Games was the same games that Tommy uh, 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 and John Carlos, uh, or Tommy Smith and John Carlos, were giving the uh, Black Power salute uh, while they were on the medal stands. Now, um, in, this, in this particular uh, um, uh, event, George Foreman had knocked out a Soviet boxer to win the uh, heavyweight championship of the world, or excuse me, the gold medal in the 1968 Games. So when it comes to this Ali Foreman matchup, Foreman was America's boy. He was the flag-waving patriot, whereas Ali was the anti-American black radical. King promotes this title bout, and it's being promoted not in Atlanta, or Los Angeles, or New York, or anywhere in America, but in Zaire, Africa, a developing world nation. And it's being promoted as a benefit to, to, to help, to assist the nation's struggling uh, political uh, regime to stabilize its society. Huge event in the developing world, and it was seen very similar to uh, Louis Schmeling, it's seen as an us versus them. It was the imperialist powers, George Foreman, versus the struggling patriot independence, Muhammad Ali. Um, so 62,000 people pack into this stadium in Zaire, mostly Africans showed up, and what you saw was what sports commentators call the rope-a-dope. 
For eight rounds, Muhammad Ali rode the ropes and pretty much absorbed body blow after body blow after body blow. On the eighth round, Ali came back out. By some stretch of the imagination, he had hidden reserves. The problem was poor George didn't have anything left. He had basically spent himself on rounds one through seven, and when Ali came out out of the ropes, uh, he nailed Foreman with a perfectly executed left-right combination and sent him to the floor. And he's bouncing over him. Uh, the ref moves him over to the corner. Ali's, been, or excuse me, Foreman's been knocked out. This represented one of several events which fomented a renaissance, cultural renaissance within the black community. If you know anything about American popular culture during this period, you know that this is the time period when the, 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 the film series Roots is established. Funk, later on in the 80s, hip-hop begins to emerge as a form of mass culture, and it's got direct connections to the black community. Ali's reputation all across the world began to change, and in the aftermath of all of this, he was becoming much, much more acceptable in American life. And uh, a lot of that has to do with the way that King was, or Don King, that is, was promoting him. Now, this is going to mark uh, a successful 20-year career that Don King's going to have. And you really got to start with Muhammad Ali, so it's actually mutually beneficial if you think about it in that way. But getting back to this whole idea of Ali's reputation beginning to change, in the wake of the rumble in the jungle, as it was known, Ali's former enemies finally gave him his due diligence. He was named the Fighter of the Year by Ring Magazine. In that same year, 1974, uh, Sports Illustrated declared him Sportsman of the Year. So although the United States culture had failed to break Ali, they more or less just kind of accommodated him now, just sort of let him be. It wasn't as if, you know, everything just changed all in a dime. Ali defended his title 11 more times, including the last fight uh, with Joe Frazier, what came to be known as the Thrilla in Manila. Both of these fighters, if you know anything about this particular fight, were soaking up punishment, but once again, it was Ali that proved victorious by summoning some hidden reserves, once again, similar to how he had in the Rumble in the Jungle. Now, I'm hopeful that this lecture illuminates two things in American life. One, that public figures, including people like Muhammad Ali, generally tend to have an evolutionary type of trend when it comes to how they're seen by the American public. Um, what Ali represented to America in the 1960s was something that was terribly wrong, something that had to be addressed and addressed immediately. It was scary, black radicalism. Today we see that as something quite, quite different. Um, today we see that as racial pride, um, racial assertiveness, uh, a man that was before his time, so to speak. Um, so you can see these things emerging in sports history, but keep in mind, we have a very different understanding of people like Malcolm X also. Um, the other thing that it illuminates is the political connections that sports have to the world around them. Um, Ali was arguably the highest profile athlete in the world at that particular moment. And when he came out against the war in Vietnam, it coincided with the student movement. It coincided with Walter Cronkite, uh, America's newsman, speaking out against the war. And if you know what comes out of 1968 and beyond, you know that there are presidents from Lyndon Johnson to Richard Nixon to Gerald Ford that become obsessed with how the American public sees their policies, including their policies uh, with respect to the American military. So with that being the case, I'm hopeful that you can see how and why Muhammad Ali is a man of the 60s with respect to the context of our class.